Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. Good morning, Mesa Church of Christ. It's great to see all of you. Great to be back. I uh, want to share a couple of things as we get started. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited about uh, being here today, but I'm also really excited about what you're about to engage in as a congregation beginning uh, this week and next, and that is a, a deep dive into study, uh, the study of fasting. I was at um, a barbecue place with the Murphys on Friday night. We went to dinner. And I just happened to glance over at the case, and I saw this. It's a Dr. Pepper bottle, for those of you that can't see it. And it's 10 to 4. And you remember what we were asked to do early on in the process at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock at 4 o'clock? Not drink a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Although some of you, that would really be a good thing, right? But we were asked to pray. To pray, Yeah. And so I want to do that. So uh, I think Dave Verrett uh, came up with that idea. Dave, you're right here, right? So I'm actually going to give this to you because you've worked up uh, a really good thirst uh, and all of the hard work you've been doing and, and drink it before you talk about fasting next week. Okay. So uh, just please keep that in mind. Yes. Yes. Thank you, brother Dave. Appreciate all the hard work he's done. Well, it's, uh, uh, an, uh, it's time for us to be in the Word together, and I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 John 4. We're going to be in that text here in just a few moments, and I want to, I want to set this up for you as we talk a little bit more today about mission and this um, incredible work that your shepherds have done. You know, we, we talked last week a little bit about what's got us to this point, and I'm so thankful for the work that Terry uh, has done in his tenure and, and so grateful that the Singletons are going to continue to be here and part of this church family, other elders and, and staff members and um, you know, brothers and sisters who've gone on before who, who got you to this place, uh, incredibly strong foundation to build on. So I'm so thankful for that. Your feedback that you're giving and your prayers that you've been offering it just creates this incredibly fertile soil for us to plant seeds and to just be in awe of our Father who will, I believe with all of my heart, bring harvest to this place. And I'm so thankful for your elders and their commitment to the, to the Lord and to the Word and, and to you as the body of Christ here. And so uh, you're, you're blessed as a congregation in, in so many ways. We talked about this a little bit last Sunday and introduced this in the context of of mission. And I just want to put this before you again that here is, is basically the mission statement. And I don't know that it's in final form, but it's pretty close. As we talk about this, this purpose for why you're here at, at this time in the Mesa Church's uh, existence and what God is trying to do through you as a body of believers. And it is to glorify God through the power of the gospel by these three primary movements. They're not the only ones, but they are primary. And that is to be a church that focuses on growing in Christ and serving in love and equipping for life. We're going to talk a little bit about that today as we explore this passage in 1 John 4. And here's my hope for you. My hope is that you will be so aligned in your heads and in your hearts that over time this just becomes natural conversation for you. That when people find out that you are part of the Mesa Church of Christ and they ask, well, what's that, what's that church about? What do you guys do? That you will immediately, just immediately be able to say, oh, let me tell you, we're a church that's about growing in, in Jesus. 
we church, we, we unashamedly serve and love. And we want to equip people to, uh, to find the fullness of Christ in this life. And my hope and prayer would be that that would really hook someone. They would go, wow, that sounds like a pretty, pretty intriguing place to be. Oh, yeah, well, let me tell you more. And it'll just open the door for very rich and meaningful, not just dialogue, but for, for absolute life change. When my um, grandmother was born, she, she lived to be 99, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, not too many years after she was born, uh, she, uh, her parents had a little sister. And that little sister was, um, was born deaf. And uh, it, still, it still just blesses me to think that she too passed away a few years back and, and it still, it just warms my heart every time I think about it, that the very first words that she will ever hear are the words, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. But my grandmother, when she was a child, learned sign language so she could talk to her sister. And my grandmother was amazingly fast. She was just so fast. Well, a few years passed, and in the last 15 years or so, my grandmother could not remember the names of her grandchildren. So I would go visit, and she would know that I was family, but she didn't exactly know who I was. But you know what? She could still sign. And sometimes people would be in conversation with her, and instead of talking, she would start signing. So she had forgotten a lot, but what did she never forget? She never forgot what was core to her being, what was so embedded in her because she practiced it and exercised it over and over and over and over again. My prayer for you as a church is that years from now, this will just be so ingrained into your DNA as a church that it will just be such a natural rhythm for you and that when people inquire, you'll just be able to say, Quickly, easily, because you're living it out, not because you've memorized it, because it's just part of who you are. We're a church. It's about growing in Christ, serving in love, equipping for life. There's a lot of texts that we could draw from to articulate a theological framework, a philosophical, even a practical framework uh, for this mission. And you're going to be exploring all of that over time as a body of believers. But today, we're just going to choose a starting point. And we're going to look at some words from a man who walked side by side with Jesus, who had truths of God directly revealed to him by the power of the Holy Spirit, and who understands the great enemy of God and how disciples of Jesus must prepare for the ruthless pursuit um, of our destruction. So we're going to begin this morning in 1 John chapter 1. I just want to do a little bit of a preview to our Uh, our text that we're going to study in detail, and we're going to start this morning in verse 4. You, dear children, and I I love this. This is almost the exact same phrase that we read last week in John chapter 13 when Jesus is addressing a rather anxious group of disciples. John says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. He's talking here about overcoming false teachers, uh, even referred to earlier in the text as false spirits, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. But we, we are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Now, as we read through what John describes here, I think there is in part um, an eschatological or an end of times phenomenon that we see in, in, in play to a certain degree. But I also think he's probably describing um, potential destruction, what, what it looks like when a culture is at its end, when a culture embraces um, lies as, as truth. But church, praise God, Scripture 
shows us not just a way out, out of lies into truth, but it reveals to us how churches can minister within the devastating impact of Satan's lies to bring others into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And in your case, through loving, serving, and equipping. So I want us to explore those themes this morning from John chapter 4, verses 7 through 19. Before we do, a quick word about the context. In the New English Bible, 1 John is given the title, A Recall to Fundamentals. And I think that's really appropriate. Because 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John focus on the fundamentals of belief and life for disciples of Jesus. 1st John has a lot in common with the Gospel of John. And as a matter of fact, if you're ever engaging in Bible study with somebody for the first time, uh, 1st John is a great place to start. Or if you personally have never read the Bible, the letter of 1st John or a sermon, really, <laughs> that is kind of taken in the form of a, of a letter, uh, it's a great place to start. At this point, John is quite a bit older, and most likely he is shepherding possibly some house churches or smaller churches in the region of Ephesus. First John, as I said, does read a little bit more like a sermon than it does a letter. It does seem to be intended for a specific group of Christians. Because the sermon refutes this false doctrine uh, that it is possible to live without sin, meaning that there was no need for the death of Jesus Christ. So if there's no need for his death, then there's no need for him. After all, if we can live without sinning, then we don't need a Savior, right? So in a nutshell, the false doctrine that John is addressing is Jesus doesn't impact the outcome of the story. That's what many in this time and in this region believed. So John pushes back on this. He pushes back on this false teaching, this false doctrine, and he uses this sermon to showcase two primary truths. The first being God is light. And we see that in the first three chapters uh, through about verse 10. Truth two, God is love. And we see that in the latter part of 1 John. And I wish we had time to read the entire letter this morning, just go from verse 1 all the way to the end, but we don't. And so I want to simply focus on one key section from chapter 4, and we're going to begin this morning in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, this seems fairly straightforward as we launch out into this passage, but it also could cause some confusion. I love what Howard Marshall writes on this particular passage. He notes, one might conclude that anybody who shows love is a child of God regardless of whether he actually believes in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And this misunderstanding can only arise, however, if we take this statement and wrench it out of its context in the letter. John makes it plain enough elsewhere that the true child of God both believes and loves. For instance, see 1 John 3, 23. He later notes, a person cannot come into a real relationship with a loving God without being transformed into a loving person. Now, this transformation that he describes, I believe, is defined in your church's mission to be a church that glorifies God through the power of good news by growing in Christ. We'll start there. Growing in Christ begins by exploring who Jesus is. By becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ and following him 
And becoming a disciple impacts our desire to tell other people the good news of who Jesus is and what he has rescued us from. I want you to notice what happens to Andrew. For instance, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 41, the first thing Andrew did after meeting Jesus was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. So here's something some of you may or may not be familiar with. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We have Jesus and we have Christ, Jesus Christ. I want to make sure we understand the difference between those two placeholders and his name. Jesus is his name. Jesus is from the old Hebrew word, uh, Yeshua or Joshua. Um, later came to be known as Jesus, and that's his name. And it means the, the Lord saves or the Lord helps. And it was actually a very, very common name at that particular time. Lots of men were named Jesus. But... There's only one Christ. There's only one anointed one. There's only one Messiah. There's only one king. And that's his title. So in a nutshell, Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Later on, his full deity is understood by his followers and is articulated by his followers. In Acts chapter 11, for instance, We see, so if God gave them, and Peter here is talking about others who have received uh, the Spirit, if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, do you see the fullness of his deity expressed in that phrase? We see his name, we see his title, we see his lordship. Who was I, Peter, to think that uh, I could stand in God's way? So when we become disciples of Jesus Christ, a phenomenon begins to occur. If we follow the teachings of Jesus, if we are obedient to the teachings of Jesus, that is, we begin to grow. And just think about it. Andrew grew in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter grew in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul grew in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can look at multiple other scriptures, and we can look at individuals throughout history who have grown in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the expression or an expression of that growth was this. They could not stop telling other people about Jesus. When you grow in Jesus, you want to tell other people about Jesus. And here's the reality I think that most of us are familiar with. Things have a tendency to go sideways when we stop growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we asked, What will make this mission stick at the Mesa Church of Christ in the heads and hearts of those who God's going to send your way? And we looked at John chapter 13 last week, verses 31 to 35, and we identified that glorifying God through the power of the gospel and that loving one another are key ingredients that are going to make your mission hard to ignore. And we noted we're joining Jesus on a rescue mission. Offering hope to those who have chosen the the six steps of ruin as we identified in Romans chapter 1. Do you remember that chart last week? Here's a a slide that showcases these six steps of ruin that we observed in Romans chapter 1. The turn away, I want to be God. The mind then begins to darken and that leads ultimately to idolatry. Um, which gives way to the Lord leaving us, turning us over to our desires, uh, never, never leaving us in the withdrawing himself from humankind. That would just be the world falling apart, but, but he leaves us to our own desires. Pleasure is then pursued at all cost, and sin reigns. So this week, my wife was engaged in a women's Bible study at our church, and uh, the teacher uh, offered a very unique group or cultural perspective on this phenomenon, meaning Romans 1 spells out these steps to ruin and how they primarily affect the individual, but but there is also a collective impact when individuals collectively walk these steps to ruin. And this is from a friend and a sister of ours uh, at the church there in College Station uh, called Nisi uh, Wooden, and she notices this gradual slide collectively of the impact of sin is that we overlook evil and then we permit evil and then we legalize evil and then we promote evil and then we celebrate it and then we persecute those who still call it evil 
You see the progression? If there was ever a greater sense of urgency in our culture to grow in Christ, surely it is now. And your elders are putting before you a challenge as a church to grow in Christ, to grow as disciples who become disciple makers. And as part of your mission, they challenge you to remember the great co-mission of Jesus, to go and make disciples, Matthew 28, verse 19. You're going to find multiple iterations of the discipleship journey in, in different training manuals, uh, but, but here's a progression I want to offer to just help you identify a pathway forward, a growth path as a follower of Jesus. Typically, there's some type of curiosity. Someone hears something about Jesus, or they hear something about the church, or they hear something about God, and it, it hooks their curiosity. They may not know much about any of those topics right now, or any of those persons, but they're just curious. And we hope and pray that through study and prayer and interaction that that curiosity moves them to belief. And once they become a believer, then hopefully, prayerfully, they become a disciple. There are believers who are not disciples. You know that, right? Because a disciple follows the teachings of Jesus. A disciple puts the teachings of Jesus into practice. Ultimately, hopefully, prayerfully, we get to that place then where disciples become disciple makers. And you may not ever be the person who actually baptizes someone, but you can still be a disciple maker. You may not be the, the person who engages in the one-on-one -on -one Bible study, but you can still be a disciple maker. Support the work of the church. Pray fervently. Stay away from meaningless arguments. Love and encourage people. These two are the characteristics of disciple makers. And that brings us back to 1 John 4. The old sage continues to write this. And what he's talking about here is remaining in God and God remaining in us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now, as you're reflecting on that verse, there's two key actions that describe the nature of God's love here in verse 9. And these two factors reveal the heart, I think, um, of what your elders want you to not just mentally acknowledge, but to own deep in your hearts. And what we see here is we see self-sacrifice that leads to benefiting others. And I'm talking first and primarily in the spiritual sense. We have two levels of, of comfort that Jesus brings to humankind as we reflect on this passage. Jesus, he left the throne of God to face the primary threat to humanity. And during his ministry, he, he leaves cultural comfort the presence of his mom and, and his, his earthly father and, and, and brothers and cousins and, and a community. He leaves all of that to ignite a cultural revolution. If I could kind of sum it up, I would say it like this. Jesus, Jesus leaves comfort to be comfort. He leaves comfort to be comfort. And I want you to notice what I did not say. I did not say Jesus left comfort to make us feel comfortable. We talked about that a little bit last week, right? There's a major difference in being comforted and being comfortable. So as we engage in spiritual war, we, we come into this place to celebrate what God is doing, but we also come into this place to encourage one another and to build one another up, and that's comforting. That's the very nature of God. We see it stated, again, a different way in verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He continues, dear friends, since God loved us that much, since God loved us that way, we also ought to love one another. 
No one's ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. So I think this echoes the first movement of your new mission, to be a church that through the power of the gospel is personally living while inviting others to grow in Christ. This is God's love being made complete in you. And I think the text also reveals the second movement of your new mission, to be a church that through the power of the gospel is personally living and inviting others to serve in love. This is, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. John speaks very boldly here. This is how we know. It's not the only place he says it, by the way. But this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anybody acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, we are like Jesus. Interesting phrase. Interesting phrase. Not exactly easy to understand what John means here. I think he means we are co heirs with our brother Jesus. At least I think that's one possible meaning. Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. As co heirs, hear this, church, hear this text. As co heirs, we have nothing to fear. Nothing. What should we be afraid of? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Something happens to me, I get hit by a bus, the next person I see is Jesus, I'm okay with that. I'm all right with that. I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to be afraid of. And not just in the context of what may or may not happen in this life, but also what happens when I ultimately stand before my God. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears isn't made perfect in love. Instead, we can put that in here parenthetically, we love because he first loves us. And what's one of the greatest expressions of that love? Is it not the third part of your mission? to be a church that equips others for life. Not just this life, but the next life as well. To equip them to be God-honoring parents, faithful children, loving husbands and wives, spiritual healers, disciple makers, and on and on and on. Paul describes it this way in Ephesians chapter 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God And become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What do you know? Look at this next slide. Growing in Christ 
serving in love, and equipping for life. You're going to start to see and hear messages and and see opportunities related to how you can begin as a church to live into this. There's no expectation that we're going to master this overnight. But growing in Christ, I think you're going to begin to see opportunities and traction and studies more and more into making disciples and into growing disciples and into practicing spiritual disciplines and being deeper in the Word. And we can go on and on and on. Serving in love, that's finding a ministry and plugging in wholeheartedly to that ministry. Opportunities just to get your hands dirty when you're in the trenches serving alongside one another. Being a church that's looking up, always keeping your focus on the Lord, but also being a church that looks in and also a church that looks out to find opportunities and ways to serve others. And just simply making service a priority for who you are and what you do. And then to be a church that's opening up your eyes and your ears, listening for those opportunities where there are gaps or or, or places to step in and, and to help others get the right tools in their toolbox, sharing your gifts, sharing your talents, and church responding to the call. God has placed a calling upon this church, and I hope and pray that you will respond as the Lord opens this door into your future. And your elders are going to have a whole lot more to say about this in coming weeks. And I'm going to explore this with you. Um, uh, When I'm back uh, in January, we'll explore this in even greater detail. But I just want to encourage you, please, please just pray, pray, pray. Take advantage of this study into the spiritual discipline of fasting that you're going to prepare for and uh, learn more about this next week. And and I also think this is really important. This is not just your elders' mission. It's your church's mission. This came out of the hard work that you have done over these past several months and through your prayers. And I hope and I pray that you will live it out enthusiastically. And I hope that you will live it out intentionally so that many sons and daughters will come to know Jesus in Mesa and beyond. Well, this is my last Sunday with you for this year. Uh, I hope and uh, uh, pray that you will pray fervently about this mission, that you will be in conversation with your your shepherds um, and, and begin talking about this as a church family and even in your own individual families. Uh, about how you can grow in Christ and how you can serve in love and how you can equip for life. And I pray you take advantage of these fasting resources and this week's bulletin and participate in that spiritual uh, discipline over the next many weeks. And I want to wish every single one of you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I definitely look forward to being back with you, Lord willing, the second weekend in January. Just because I'm gone doesn't mean the work of the committee stops. The search team is still going to be engaging in conversation and setting up some conversations with some of your candidates. And we look forward to having a good report for you after the first of the year on where we are in that process. I'd like for us to pray this morning as we close our time together. After this prayer, we're going to sing a song. We call it a song of encouragement or a song of invitation. And it is just an opportunity to invite you to share with this church a desire to be baptized, a request for prayers. Um, There'll be a few of our elders who will be down front. Or you can just turn to the person next to you in the pew and express any thoughts that you might have. Uh, Someone can just pray with you right there on the spot. But let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing. Father, thank you so much for the blessing of the morning. We are so grateful for the wise, uh, sage, older apostle John as he wrote these sweet and powerful words that we have studied this morning. Father, let us not just give these words mental assent, but let us own them deep in our hearts and be a church, Father, purposefully, intentionally, often, that desires and exercises Uh, Father, growing um, in Christ and serving in love and equipping for life. We love you. We thank you, Father. In Jesus we pray. Amen.